half a dozen times in the last several days, I've had people come to me, and you're, I'm approachable, I will never defy your confidence, but they've expressed to me thoughts that they were having that I know to be absolutely false. The safest one that I can tell you is one person came to me and was, was expressing how they, they just feel so discouraged and they feel so disliked. Nobody likes me. Nobody cares about me. I kind of am that type of person that, that nobody ever notices. I fall within the cracks. Nobody says anything nice to me. Nobody ever. And you know what? I know that's not true. It's a feeling that's real. It's, 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 a, it's a true feeling, but it's not a true statement. And we're struggling against the whole question of deception and we're striving for discernment. And we're going to look at 1 John in doing that. Now, as I say this, there's a question, what should I believe? Should I believe every little thing that's whispered in my ear? I, I've, I've said to many people through counseling sessions, through other things, I say it to myself all the time. In fact, I'll be transparent right now. Almost every Sunday, Sunday afternoons, many of you know I take a long walk. You know why I do that? Because I, as I preach God's word, there's a sense of confidence that I have because of what God has helped me to, to understand and to know and, and, and to be able to communicate. But there's also an evaluation process that goes through in my life that I, I walk away here, and you know what? I, I hear both encouraging comments from people, but I hear things that maybe I'm not taking it right. Maybe it's, it's not a true statement, but you know, there, there's a sense of, boy, I blew that one. Did anybody get anything out of that message? Does anybody ever care? What difference does it make? And, and I, I challenge, that's the challenge to me. And you know what? There are statements that people make and they think they're being constructive in their criticisms, but they're saying it at the wrong time because Satan's going to take and run with it and whisper in my ear. And I'll stop with that because this is not poor, poor, poor me syndrome. That's not where I am right now. I'm just speaking transparently and truthfully. What should I believe? What thoughts? How many times does Satan whisper in my ear? What should I believe? Secondly, how much does the whole question of cultural stuff, how much does it affect our views and our values? Next week, we're going to have a very short message. We're celebrating communion. There's a lot of things going on next week. But what I'm going to talk about will relate to the election. But I'm not going to talk politics. I promise you that. But when we look at the culture and the views and values, you know what? It's a toss-up. Because both candidates are for president. All four of the candidates on the, on the ballot for president are, are just, there, there's, there's not one of them that's qualified to be our president. But you know what? I'm a sinner saved by grace, and by grace, that's the only thing that qualifies me to possibly, and I don't want the job. But how much influence does our culture have on my views and values? Too much. Too much, I'll say that. Now, there are three basic reasons why we're doing this study today. It's right here in the notes. It's right there, and I think on the, I believe it's on the front page of the notes. And first off, I want us to understand that spiritual warfare is an, authentic, is an actual, authentic reality. It isn't a facet of our imagination. It isn't something that we think is going on and say, oh, I'm being deceived now. No, it's an actual, authentic reality. And it exists in the world all around us all the time. For followers of Christ, spiritual warfare affects every area of our lives. Every single one. There's nothing that escapes the whole question of spiritual values and spiritual warfare and spiritual impact. Why? Because we're followers of Jesus Christ. Every decision we make, every thought we have, every action we carry out, every attitude 
is touched by a sense of spiritual warfare. And to be very frank with you, spiritual warfare is jihad. I think it's funny that the Islamic folks would use that word as their term for holy war because jihad does describe spiritual warfare, but it's unholy war. It's political issues. It's personal issues. It affects every part of our lives. Secondly, it is absolutely essential. We cannot avoid how essential it is. It it is so necessary that we acknowledge. We need to make a specific acknowledgement that our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ That affects the nature of the attacks that we experience. I've heard so many times in my life, hey, trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and everything's going to get better in your life. I wish that was true. Everything gets better regarding the hope I have for eternity. There is a blessing that I receive which we're going to talk about today because Christ is my Lord and Savior. Yes. But my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will affect every aspect of of how the attacks come toward me and at me. Jesus said, I, I didn't count them all, but He said many times repeatedly, hey guys, to the disciples, the world's going to hate you. You're going to face difficulties because of me. And and that's the truth. Now, realize when we balance it all out, I'll take those difficulties because I know life lasts forever. And our time here is temporary, and we're going to talk about that today too. And what lasts forever makes all the difference in the world. I don't want to spend eternity absent from God. And then thirdly, we need to be alert to the strategies that are used by the adversary. We can't turn a blind blind eye toward it. I, I was teaching a Bible study. This was 30 years ago. And I was relatively new at the church where I was teaching, and I was teaching this Bible study. It was from the book of Mark. I can remember explicitly where I was sitting because a man in the group, a man that really I, 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 I found him to be a very godly man. He was an older gentleman. I, I, I did his wife's funeral. I remarried him when he married another widow from the church. I did his funeral. But he stopped me in the middle of this Bible study. It was was about something that Jesus was dealing with regarding the devil. And he says, stop right now, Pastor. We don't need to hear that stuff. Don't talk about that because the more you talk about it, the more problems we have. And I'll never forget the moment because I'm thinking, do I challenge this guy at that or what do I say? And I'm going to tell you right now, because I'm probably inching up to the age that the guy, that guy was at this point. We need to be alert to the strategies of the adversary. We can't pretend like they don't exist. And we need to be aware of what God has made available to us for our assurance. God has not left us hopeless God has not left us with a sense of, oh no, what do we do now? We need to be aware of the things God has made available to us to provide assurance for us. So, we're turning to 1 John, and these next few statements here are just quick run through, except I want to emphasize something in just a second that you'll see. You'll understand why. But I want us to become better acquainted with John. Who is this guy that wrote this letter? Who is this guy that tells us these things? Well, number one, John was one of Jesus' closest earthly friends. He knew Jesus as well as anyone did. 
And he was also one of his most faithful followers. He's the first to acknowledge the resurrection. He, he was clearly one of Christ's closest advocates. Secondly, his ministry was centered on the message of the gospel. And this is what I want us to see, because I'm not going to be able to review this, but it's vital that we get this foundation laid because his center on the gospel. How do we know that? He wrote in John 3, 16 and 17. Most famous passage in all the Scripture for some people. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish. Belief in the Lord Jesus Christ means we don't perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge or condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. John was gospel-centered. He also wrote, John 20, verses 30 and 31, Therefore, many other signs, many things I could write about. Jesus did all kinds of things that aren't written in my book. And they performed in the presence of the disciples, he says, which are not written in this book, now the next section, but these have been written so that you, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah, the Son of God, and believing, in that believing you may have life in His name. John was gospel-centered. Now also in 1 John 5, verses 11 through 13, he writes, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. There's no gray area there. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know and that word no in the Greek language is the idea of absolute certainty. That you might know that you have eternal life. John was gospel centered. Now, quickly, a couple other thoughts here. He faced a scourge of persecution, he was arrested for his faith. He was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he received the revelation of Jesus. And from there, he wrote the final book of the Bible. That's the man that's recorded these things that we're reading, studying today. And finally, why did he write 1 John? He wrote 1 John to strengthen our faith. To give us a sense of strength in what we believe. A sense of encouragement. A sense of comfort. A sense of assurance. And he wrote to straighten the focus of our lifestyles. He wrote to tell us in the midst of spiritual battles, we have a place where we can turn. When the Cubs lose a couple of games, we can say, hey, it's just a game. And I'm literally not saying that to be funny. I'm saying that because what, no matter you fill in the blanks, whatever it is, you can say, wait a minute now, God's in charge. So now let's recognize why we can be encouraged. Let's recognize what the Bible says in 1 John to tell us why we can be encouraged. First thing is, there's the greatest announcement of all time. The greatest announcement, literally the words that John uses here, he uses the word for announcement. Actually, it's the word for angel. But he used the word for announcement several times repeatedly here in 1 John. And that greatest announcement of all time is that God has provided an opportunity for each of us to enjoy a close personal relationship with Him. And the sad part of that, the challenging part of that is, is oftentimes we take that for granted. That becomes secondary in our lives. That's a Sunday experience. Maybe Wednesday night. Oh, maybe I'll go to men's Bible study. Maybe I'll go to ladies' Bible study. But the rest of the week, that personal relationship with, life, too, with Christ, too often it gets made a secondary issue. 
And that's good news. That's an announcement that is amazing. God has provided for us an opportunity that each one of us can enjoy a close personal relationship. We can enjoy personal fellowship with Him. And the passage itself, now notice what it says here. We're going to go through this and see what it says and understand it. And this is the announcement. The angelion. This is the announcement we have heard from Him and announce we angelo to you that God is light. And in Him there is no darkness. There is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we're lying. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And that's not fellowship with other people. That's fellowship with God in us. We have fellowship with one another, with God and, and, and me. And it says, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. Or Satan is deceiving us, one, one or another. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous, faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First thing we see there, God is light and in Him there is no darkness whatsoever. Zero. God is completely, totally, 100% holy. There's no corruption. There's no sinfulness. There's no evil. There is nothing short of absolute perfection. That's the God that we worship. Secondly, if we say we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That's simply stating that my sinful nature separates me from God and His holiness. Now let's say, I got on the bottom of the screen here, there are many other theological ideas that could be expressed or explained here. The Bible teacher in me wants to dig in deeper and tell you everything that's in this passage. I don't have time. For our purposes today, we want to emphasize that my natural tendency towards sin separates me from God. My natural tendency towards sin, it separates me from God. Next section there, but if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, if we walk in the light of His Word, if we walk in the guidance that He gives us, if we walk by the power of the Holy Spirit, if we allow Him to lead our lives in obedience, we have fellowship. God and I have fellowship together. And it says, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. The point there is Jesus died on the cross to make provision for our forgiveness. He died to make provision. It goes on and says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And it cleanses from all unrighteousness. He's trying to express for us that if we admit that we are sinners, can't do it on my own, can't save myself, can't be good enough. I had someone question this week. Someone that should have known better came to me and said, you know what, I'm just wondering, I've been talking to some people that they grew up in a, in a church that believes that your good is measured by your bad and, and that's what's going to get you to heaven. He says, how much of that can we still believe and be saved? And as this person that asked this question said it to me, I'm thinking, you should know better than that. You teach the Bible. You teach classes. You teach, and you're asking that question. And you know what's funny? I talked to someone yesterday, someone else, actually, another pastor, and I, I said, you know, I had somebody ask me this question. I was just discussing with them. We just bought our Halloween candy, and we were standing there talking. And I said, you know, how important it is that, that, that people have that appropriate understanding and training. 
You know what that pastor said to me? He says, don't make it too important. Barna's polls show that 55% of the people in our churches believe that there's a certain level of goodness that all of us attain, and that's part of our salvation. That's a lie. We need to admit we're sinners, acknowledge that we need what God has provided through the death of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, we are forgiven. And we're no longer facing the judgment and the condemnation for our sinfulness. But only when we admit, God, I can't do it on my own. When I admit that God has provided everything that's necessary that's salvation. We'll look at the next little section here of this passage. He writes in verses 12 through 14 of chapter 2, he says, I'm writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven you for His name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know Him who has been from the beginning and I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome you have defeated the evil one. And I have written to you children because you know the Father. In verse 14, I have written to you fathers because you know Him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the Word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. When he says, I've written to you little children because your sins are forgiven for His name's sake, understand something. Our sins are forgiven for the benefit of God's reputation and testimony throughout the world. Our sins are forgiven for His name's sake. God's reputation, God's testimony is at stake. And He forgives us for the sake of His testimony and reputation. Secondly, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I've written to you children because you know the Father. Understand our intimate fellowship with God the Father enables us to be victorious over the temptations and trials that we face from the evil one. When I walk in the light, when I walk in intimate fellowship with God the Father, I have the ability to overcome the trials and the temptations that come to me from the evil one. He says, finally, in this section, I've written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong. You're strong. And the Word of God, that's the key. It abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Why do I teach God's Word? Well, I teach God's Word because I sense a call in my life to do that. I sense that God has given me the gifts to try to communicate it in as clear and in as effective a fashion as possible. But I teach it because I find that our knowledge and our understanding of God's Word provides us with the strength. The strength that we need to obey what the Word teaches us. When I understand it, I am given the strength to obey it, and therefore I obtain victory over the temptations and trials that we face from the evil one. Here's another passage from another section that describes that. He says in, 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 his, in his message, God says through Paul in his message to the Corinthians, he says, therefore, let him who thinks he can stand on his own, let him who thinks he can do it by himself, let him who's got pride and arrogance in the whole process take heed lest he fall but understand this, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common. It happens to everyone. It's common to man. God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will provide for you the way of escape 
so that you may be able to endure it. And as we summarize and look at this first point one time and look at an application in it to some extent, the greatest announcement of all time is realized through God's gracious supply to our lives and His in, in our faithful submission to Him. His gracious supply, our faithful submission to Him, through that we enjoy freedom from the penalty of sin. Romans 8.1, there, 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 there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Freedom from the penalty of sin. Receive forgiveness and pardon for our sin. The ongoing problem of sin. I am consistently forgiven and pardoned for the ongoing problem of sin. And I enjoy personal fellowship with God. I enjoy personal fellowship with God. That is the greatest announcement ever made, but now let's go on. Because we can't ignore the fact that we have the most devious adversary of all time that we face day in and day out. The most devious adversary, the evil one, You've heard me read from John here. He says, you've overcome the evil one, the evil one, the evil one. He repeatedly mentions the evil one in this letter. And understand, the evil one, John wrote, we miss sometimes when we don't study Scripture in, in a methodical way. John wrote an awful lot about the adversary that brings spiritual warfare into our lives. John also wrote more about the Holy Spirit than anybody else. We're going to see that in a few moments. But in John chapter 8, in his gospel, and I want to read this section for us just to see what it has to say. John expresses the words of Christ. He's the only gospel writer that said this. When he says, Jesus is speaking, you are of the Father you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the religious leaders of the day. He says he was a murderer from the beginning and does not, does not stand in the truth. He says because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. But for this reason, those of you that that you're not getting it, he says, for this reason you do not hear them because you are not of God. There's John writing the words of Christ describing our adversary, the father of lies, the deceiver from the very beginning. And we find in this passage where John writes and says, verse 15 through 19 of chapter 2, he says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If, you, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Right? His children, and it's the last hour. Just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, prophetically speaking, as even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this you know that it is the last hour. He says, they went out from us and they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they were not of us. As we look at that, that first section, children, or that last section that I read, children, it's the last hour you've heard Antichrist, an Antichrist is coming. Well, Antichrists are already here. Let's realize that what he's saying there 
just very simply speaking, is there's an Antichrist, there's a future Antichrist prophetically coming, but the Antichristian influence, it comes from the adversary and has been active in the world since Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. It's been active in the world since that very day. Realize that. Secondly, he tells us, do not love the world nor the things of the world. Let's realize that's where the spiritual battles begin. When we place too high of a priority on things that belong down here, that's where the spiritual battle begins. This is where God begins to become a secondary influence in our lives and also in our lifestyles. God becomes second. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, all the things in the world, what is it? It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And those things aren't from the Father, but they're from the world itself. And he's telling us that when lust sets in, our trust in God grows weak. When lust sets in, our trust in God grows weak. Oh, if I only had this, if I had a new car, if I had a better house, if I had more money, if I had this, if I had that, whenever that begins to be the focus of our attention, our trust in God grows weak. Let's realize when he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That will lead to lust and pride. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. And at that point, we begin to forget the last thing that he says in that section, he says, this world is passing away. It's temporary. And also all the desires and lusts that we have from it, but the one who does the will of God will live forever. Look at the order of ideas there and the sequence, the results that he's describing there. We love the world, that leads to lust and pride. Lust and pride, that leads to forgetting that, hey, this world is temporary. This is not my home, I'm just passing through. I want to define lust and pride, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, both of pride. They're closely related. Lust and pride, closely related to one another. In fact, I'd say they're in fellowship with one another because they have a common bond and work together like a fine-tuned team trying to distract us, trying to get our attention, trying to drag us down and get our attention away from God and onto all the things that are our lusts, desires, our temptations and trials. Lust and pride are intimately related to spiritual warfare. They're related to spiritual warfare. They appeal to our sinful nature and we are drawn to the darkness. We're drawn to the darkness. What are they? They are desires for personal pleasure. They are cravings for what we believe or think will bring a sensation of satisfaction and fulfillment. How many times do we think, well, if this would happen, things would be so much better? I'll even put a ministry spin on it. I've had friends that were, well, you know, I've got a friend that played in the NBA. I had friends that played in the NFL. And these friends that played in the NFL, they were guys that I went to school with in seminary. And we'd talk about certain athletes and how much of a pedestal they had 
to be an example for others. And one of the things we would catch ourselves saying is, you know, if so-and-so would only come out and be stronger in his faith, just think how great that would be. Just think, you know, that would be wonderful. And it would be wonderful, yes, but you know what? Sometimes we put that person ahead of God. We think that certain events in life will do what only God can do. And that's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. That's putting God in a secondary position. That's thinking, God, you can't manage this. I have to figure it out for you. And we have to be careful in those areas. What happens is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, all that's in the world, they lead to desires. They lead to deceptions. They lead to distractions. They lead to difficulties. And as we summarize this second thought, this second idea, let's realize the most devious adversary of all time, the devil in the devil's workshop, the weapons of warfare most used by our spiritual enemy involve deceiving and distracting us with lies and lusts. And it is oh so necessary that we remain focused on God's Word to be able to develop a spiritual discernment to awaken us to what the Holy Spirit wants us to think and to do. And let's realize that we're constantly facing a barrage of deceptions and distractions, of lies and lusts that pull us away from our, from our absolute faith in God. So thirdly, let's understand the most amazing advantage that we could ever desire. The most amazing advantage we can ever desire. That's God's promises that's that he will never leave us. That's the Holy Spirit who comes to live inside of us. That's his personal presence in our lives. And notice what it says. We're looking at three or four passages as we close this. He says in chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, he says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know I have, written, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. Now, get that. Some people say, well, why do you keep repeating things? Why do you teach things over and over again? Why do you express those thoughts? It's because you do know it. Not because you don't. But reminders are a blessing. And he's saying there's no lie in the truth. There's no false. There's no deception in the truth. This is in verses 26 and 27 of chapter 2. These things I have written to you concerning the, those who are trying to deceive you. I want you to know about their strategies. I want you to know, he's, as for you, on the other hand, he says, you have an anointing which you've received from him who abides in you. You have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, so abide in him. Breaking it down very briefly, very quickly, he says, you have an anointing from the Holy One. As for you, the anointing you receive from him who abides in you, anointing, literally, that's supernatural provision. It's not hocus-pocus. It's not some special event that takes place. It's not secondary let me tell you, there are beliefs out there that says that we receive the blessing, the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit at a time subsequent after our salvation. That's false. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us the moment, the instant, the, mig, the millisecond that we believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the anointing takes place. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of our lives that very moment. It's the Holy Spirit. Secondly, 
Let's realize that John, John wants to introduce us to the Holy Spirit. And he did a great job of introducing us to the Spirit. His writings about the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 16, once again, it's the only place in Scripture where we find what Jesus taught the disciples on that upper room. And the focus of what Jesus taught in the upper room that night is I'm sending the Spirit to live inside of you. He promises and explains in the upper room that He will send the Spirit to permanently reside in us. Going on, He says, this is the commandment. We believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. He says, and love one another just as He commanded us. The one who keeps His commandments abide in Him and He in Him. See, we keep His commandments and therefore we, we, we abide. We, we allow Christ to be the leader of our lives. And then when we allow Christ to be the leader of our lives, it says, and then he will, he will always be there for us. And we know this. Why? We know that He abides in us by the Spirit that He has given us. There's this internal sense that the Spirit is there. He says in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but rather test the spirits. Now, there are times when I hear people talking and I can't invade their conversation. I can't interrupt, but I want to scream out, Test it! Check it out! Don't believe everything! Pour it through a filter of God's Word. There are many false prophets that have gone out. They've gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit who confesses that Jesus is the Christ. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Of which you've heard that it is coming, and now it's already in the world. When he says this, realize, do not believe every spirit, but test them. Discernment is essential because our culture is filled with deception. It's filled with deception. He goes through this description here. He says, by this, know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess is not from God. What he's trying to tell us there is that any and every belief system, every single one that denies Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation, is spiritual deception. There are Christian churches that profess to be Christian churches. They don't believe Jesus is the only way to salvation. It's spiritual deception. There are cultic churches. They clearly say, no, Christ was a prophet or Christ was among many or we're working our ways to be Christ. Or Jesus Christ, death wasn't enough. You need to have good works in your life. You need to earn your salvation. Any any faith that denies that Jesus is the only way for salvation through His shed blood on Calvary, spiritual deception. And spiritual deception is spiritual warfare. It's spiritual warfare. And finally, the clincher. The thing that I want us to emphasize the strongest and the most is where he says in 4 through 6 of chapter 4. He says, You are from God, little children. You've overcome all those spiritual deceptions. You've overcome all those lies. You've overcome all of that. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Can I get an amen on that one? He says, they are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world. The world listens to them. How many times do we listen to them? Too often, I'm afraid. 
We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He was not from God, does not listen to us. By this, you know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's realize, little children, that's us. For faithful followers of Jesus Christ, we've trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior. We've overcome all that stuff. Why? Because greater is he. Ephesians 1, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of me the moment I believe. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ won the ultimate victory, the ultimate battle on Calvary. His Spirit resides in the life of each and every faithful follower of Christ. And look at the word that John uses in chapter 16 of his gospel where I said he talks about the Holy Spirit a lot. He tells us what Jesus said. These are Jesus' words once again. Jesus is speaking to disciples. He started off this set, this, this set of, of, this, of, of statements by saying, let not your heart be troubled. John 14, 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's in my father's residence, so to speak, there are many dwelling places. Paul, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Dot, 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 all the way down to chapter 16. He said, oh, chapter 14, I'm leaving you the Spirit. The Spirit's going to take over. But he verses, says, says in chapter 16, verses 7 through 11, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage. The greatest advantage that anybody could ever desire it is your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin. Will convict the world concerning righteousness, justice, and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. And concerning justice, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, he's been judged. Jesus Christ won the ultimate victory for all of us who depend on him in my faith. And let's understand the most amazing advantage we could ever desire the reason why we should not fear spiritual warfare. Realize it's there. Understand it's something to be respected, yes, but it's not something to be feared. Why? Because when I've totally trusted in Christ as my Lord and my Savior, at that point, His personal presence comes and invades my life. He comes to rule and reside in my life. And greater is he who is in me. Is he who lives in me than any single influence, any single idea, any single spiritual being who happens to be in the world. So as we close, am I properly prepared? There's no reason why we shouldn't be. Am I effectively equipped for spiritual warfare? Understand, God has graciously granted me everything. Everything I need. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the truth of your word. I realize that muscle memory, that brain memory, is for, it, it, it makes me say that statement every time I preach. God, I thank you for the truth of your word. This morning I want to stop and just say, God, your word is truth. 
and your word needs to invade my life to effectively equip me, to properly prepare me so that I can answer the adversary with truth when he spreads his lies at me and about me. I can rely on the Holy Spirit who is greater than any influence that I face. He is greater than any battle that tries to take me down. Father, I thank You that we have the armor and the ability to overcome the evil one. Help us as we face this culture, as we face these challenges. And once we dismiss from this place after singing, Father, help us to walk out with a spring in our step because we have victory. We have hope. We have all that's necessary to overcome. Be glorified, please, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.